God, we're going to do verses 1 and 2. Please stay.
requests that you see there. Since our crew at work last work, the food pantry has gone through most of all the canned care of van givings. So we can use peanut butter, applesauce, pears and peaches, canned and pasta sauce, box cereals, mac and cheese, and laundry detergent, as well as the toilet paper that we mentioned last week. Isn't it amazing that they can go through that much stuff? It's amazing. So if you feel so inclined, please um, consider uh, donating to that. The youth group started this week on Wednesday, and they, they meet when school is out early on Wednesday, and all youth and volunteers are welcome. Any other announcements that need to be made? Will you join in the call to worship? What a fellowship. What a joy divine. What a blessedness that what a peace is mine. We are safe and secure, secure leaning on the everlasting arms of God. God. And our next hymn is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, found on page 560 in your chalice.
Lord, we bring these gifts to honor you and to praise you. And we do believe, though it's not magic, that you will multiply them in order for us to continue your kingdom here on earth. Amen. You may be seated. Well, last week, for those of you who were at the outdoor service in the park, we looked at relationships. We looked at what a healthy relationship is and the model that we have for that perfect loving relationship, which is God. So this week, we're going to kind of continue. Um, we're getting into the good, the bad, the ugly. We're going to look at maybe what unhealthy relationships look like, those that are maybe toxic. And we add the scripture. I made it short, sweet, simple, so you can memorize it. It's from 1 Corinthians 15.33. He says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. I'm going to read that again. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. With that, I'm going to have the kids come on up. How are you guys doing? I love your shirt. What does this say? Come here, why don't you stand up here so everybody can turn around so everybody can see your shirt. It says smile on the front and the back says focus on God more than self. Your day, start your day with a smile. I love that. So if you had a friend who was feeling kind of down and out and she looked at your shirt, would it make her feel worse or better? Better, that's right. Grumpy and sad, she saw that, and you showed up with a smile just like your shirt. How can you not be happy? Do you guys have friends? Do you have a friend? Yeah, I do. You do? Yes. Me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, you gotta choose your friends wisely. <laughs> Tell them I get. I'm sorry. It's well, we're going to be talking about relationships. That's a big word, which means the thing between you and your mom, you and your brother, you and your dad, you and your friends, you and your grandma. It's that bond that you have between. Do you love your folks? Of course you do. They do good things for you, right? And they love you back. And same way with your grandma. And same way with your friends. But you know what? There's going to be times that you're going to run into friends that aren't going to be quite so nice. And that's when we have to make a decision. If we, we can be nice to them, we're always supposed to be nice to them, but maybe we're not supposed to be their best friend if they try to get us to do things we're not supposed to do or to act in a way that really isn't what your shirt says. It's kind of hard to act mean and grumpy if your shirt says smile, right? God loves you. You know what? I do the same thing. I'm constantly wearing t-shirts that talk about Jesus and my license plate talks about Jesus because on those days when I don't feel very Christ-like, I have to remind myself that everybody's looking at my t-shirt and looking at my license plate. <laughs> and it changes my attitude. And that's really what it's all about. Because when you're a good friend to somebody, it's going to make them want to be a good friend to somebody else. And if you put a smile on their face, they're going to probably want to put a smile on someone else's face too. Okay? So, to keep that smile going, Skittles, for you? Because how can you not smile when you're eating Skittles when I would even be nice and give one to you take to your brother? Because you got to give it to Lord. Give it to Lord. Okay. Much fire does it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you uh, are in a perfect relationship with us and you give us things to smile about and to carry that smile to those around us and you teach us how to be good friends. We ask that you put good friends in our path. We thank you for all these things. Amen. Okay. You go back. Well, relationship. So for those of you who were there last week, right, we looked at what the perfect relationship is. One that God has modeled for us. One that is in community and relation in a, in a loving relationship. I, I said, you know, it's that one that we, we sing the song all the time. I go to the garden home. Right? With the on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. Not 
Did you remember? Right? And it's those good times. It's those people who feel like they're bipolar. Maybe they are. This is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or Mrs. You know, one minute everything is wonderful. And then the next minute, it's a 180 degree difference. That's how we get sucked in. As Christians, I would say this is the problem. Because we're told to be nice, right? To be Christ-like. And so when everything goes bad, we're what? To look for the good things. <laughs> Remember the good things. Maybe they're just going through a rough spot. Maybe they are, but if it is a pattern, it's those red flags. I tell everybody, go with your gut instinct. We don't do that enough. What did the scripture say? Beware, right? Because if you hang around the wrong people, they're going to corrupt your own morals. Eventually, they're going to take you down the path that you don't want to go. So how do you know if you have somebody like that in your life? Do you wake up in the morning, and if they call or if you have to go to work, you are literally starting to dread going or being with them or talking to them? Yeah, that's the case. So we need to pray about it. Find out what is God asking us to do in that situation. Are they ones who are always taking and never giving? Because you're the good little Christian. Are you the one constantly giving, 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 giving? But you don't get anything back from that relationship. I think that's probably one of the biggest ones. I had uh, some good advice this morning when I was thinking about this. You know, as far as when to speak and when not to speak. We, we've been kind of doing our podcast a little bit on this because we're in a world that is hurting so bad. People right now are grasping for relationship advice, but good advice. You know, well, what's the benchmark? What do I put this against? We said, when you're around toxic people, what were you always raised as? Children should be seen, but not heard, right? Silence is golden. golden. When silence is not golden. So let's think of something really simple. Who here has ever gone out to eat at a restaurant or even through the drive-thru? What you ordered is not what you got. Didn't come out right. How many people said, um, or drove back around the drive thru and said, this is wrong? Or how many people just shut up and hit it anyway? <laughs> All right, how many are with people who said, oh, just be quiet, you'll learn to like mayonnaise on your chicken sandwich? Or you order a very expensive steak and you want it medium well and they bring it out still red and moody. How many people say, I want good more? Why I bring this up, it seems like something simple, right? But if we're not willing to speak up on something that's simple like that, when life gets hard, when decisions become very difficult, when you are being called to have to stand up and say something, either against somebody who's toxic or a situation, how apt are you going to do that? Or are you going to sit back and be the good little Christian and keep your mouth shut? Go with the flow. Don't ruffle feathers. You know, the scripture is full of Jesus with demonstrations not keeping his mouth shut. <laughs> not going with the flow. Not taking the physical abuse above when he was trying to. We're not talking about the cross. That was a choice. We we're talking about before. Luke 6, 28. Jesus said, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So now what he's talking about right here with the disciples at this point in time of course, they were being persecuted by the Romans, and they were being persecuted by the Pharisees. But he's saying, you can still have healthy boundaries, but don't fall into the same trap as them. 
Don't turn evil for evil. If they're going to curse you, you're going to bless them. If they're going to abuse you, you're going to pray for them and pray for God to show you how to use that situation. As I said about standing up, if you remember when I did the message on the letter to the, the churches, I told of Diedrich Bonhoeffer during World War II. Actually, the movie's coming out in November. It's around Thanksgiving. I strongly encourage everybody to go to it. But this is when Hitler had just taken over, and this is when he started to persecute the Jews, and he was starting the concentration camps. There was 18,000 pastors, and of the 18,000 pastors, only six of them stood up and took a stand and said, this is wrong. 12,000 were just good little Christians and didn't say anything. They went with the flow. Then when push came to shove, and they were literally exterminating the Jews, out of the 6,000, only 3,000 was willing to still continue to take that stand. And the other three, instead of just dropping off, they actually joined sides. <laughs> with Hitler. How does evil happen? For good men to sit, or women to sit back and do nothing. Jesus' is love is full of, he loves to do contrary things. In fact, he even says in the scripture, on the contrary, this is hooked up with Luke, if your enemy is hungry, what would we say? What would the world say? Let him be hungry. Jesus says, feed them. If your enemy is thirsty, what are we supposed to do? Give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap fiery coals of shame on their heads. How many here know that scripture? Nobody's parents ever did that? Oh, good grief. I was raised on that scripture. I was bullied so bad in school. And my dad's advice to me constantly was, well, just be overly nice to them and it'll be like putting burning coals on their head. And when he first said that, I was all excited because I was thinking of the torture that was going to happen to them. <laughs> and it didn't. And then I'm like, that, this doesn't make sense. He was telling me, don't lower yourself to what they're doing. Continue to be nice. Keep your distance. You don't have to be chummy chummy with them and best friend. Keep your distance. But by being nice to them, you're turning their evil into their own shame. And guess what? Some of those kids, once they finally got older, they actually apologized. Because it wasn't mean to them like they had been to me. You know, the scripture that we looked at originally from 1 Corinthians, it says, Do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. Who here has ever heard the term, if you associate with skunks, you start to smell like them? Again, am I the only one that was raised that way? My dad learned that from his pastor, who then, my dad passed it down to me, and guess what? I passed it on down to my kids. That's pretty darn sound advice, right? What happens if you're around skunk? Are you going to come out of there unscathed? Maybe once if you're lucky. Not very often. And I love that term with a skunk. Because you can't just wash that off. <laughs> it lasts. You know, I said uh, my dad, I was thinking about that. My, my great-grandmother, she was the one I really got to know when I was younger. And she, I loved her dearly. And she had this big old white Cadillac convertible. It had the plush seats. Now, this was before I was born. But my dad would take her out to eat, the chances are. And he took her out to eat for a drive, and he hit a skunk with that car. <laughs> she couldn't put it in the garage for two to three weeks. There was not enough aerosol stuff made to get the smell of that skunk out of the car. See, that's what happens when we are allow ourselves to stay in that relationship with someone who is toxic. Smell. It's that negative energy. You know it. The kind when you just walk away that you're like, hmm, you know, you just, it's nasty. As Christians, we're called to still be nice to them. If we're hungry, we're going to give them something to eat. 
And if they're thirsty, we're going to give them something to drink. But we don't have to sit with them in that state. Proverbs 22 says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. As I said, it's just like that frog analogy, right? You get into that nice hot tub, it's just perfect temperature, everything is perfect. When the heat is cranked up, do we jump out? Or will we sit there going, but it was good, I think it'll get good again. And the longer we stay with whatever that relationship is, and we pick up their bad habits, we pick up their bad traits, it starts to entangle ourselves. God is all about boundaries, healthy boundaries. If we look at what Christ did, he was the perfect model of what healthy boundaries look like. Everything that was done to him, everything that happened, he allowed that to happen. And there was times he removed himself from it. That is a good lesson right there. I always said I love, Kenny Rogers said it best, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Maybe I struck a nerve. You know, I also know that people deal with abuse of all different kinds, and maybe they had it from early on. And this is also another really touchy subject. But the problem is, when somebody has been abused when they are young, all of a sudden they start realizing they can't trust the very people that were supposed to protect them. They start making bad decisions. They start acting out. And those bad decisions continue to lead to more bad decisions as they get older and older. And the friendships that they then create and the relationships that they create after that are not typically healthy ones because something has already gone awry. I've always said if I can do anything to help stop a bad cycle or to change someone's perspective or if they've been going down the wrong road of a bad relationship after bad, and it can even be friendship, just picking people that are safe, they think, but not healthy does not lead to a good end result. It's kind of why my motto has always been, whether you take what I say to heart or not, you can't say I didn't tell you. And how that came about was when we were raising miniature horses, um, we had, a, there was a virus that had come through and, and they got a lot of them sick and then with that and some warmer, we started losing a lot of babies. And afterwards, I had people tell me, oh yeah, they knew that. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? We could have saved so many. They kept it to themselves. And I made a vow to myself that day that my job was to help save as many, whether it be animals or people as possible. You know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in church is not easy. It's hard stuff. And I don't know how you're going to take it and internalize it. But you can't ever come back and say, why didn't you tell me? It could have saved me more heartache. It could have saved me from this bad decision. It could have saved me from choosing a different path. So what do we do? if we know that we're in some sort of toxic relationship. There's something we can't get out of. You know, maybe it's in the workplace and you need that job. You can't just quit your job. So how do you deal with that? Or if you're in school and you can't leave your friends, you can't leave your teacher, you know, how do you deal with that? Maybe it's a spouse and you can't leave your spouse, unless it's physical abuse. How do we deal with that? We start right with the scriptures. What is Jesus saying? What is God saying? Put up those healthy boundaries and say, even though I am going to be Christ-like to you, I'm not going to let you affect me inside. I'm not going to let you pull me down 
that same hole. I'm not going to let you ruin my day. <laughs> oh, it's a lot easier to say than to do. I know, I get that. But it's what we have to keep telling ourselves over and over and over. And if it is just friends, maybe you need to let them go. It's okay to know when to walk away. But somebody who's really abusing you, it's okay to know when to run. So my challenge to you, you might have hit a lot of nerves today. Again, it's not an easy topic to talk about. But how would we view this in light of scriptures? What would Jesus say? He says, on the contrary, <laughs> don't follow the world. Follow me. When they're evil, still do good and show light. But you don't have to keep silent. We're going to look as the weeks keep coming up. There's some exciting things that you know, scriptural passages, stories that you know in the Bible, but you don't know the full scope. Healings that Jesus did, why he did them, when he did them, and how they are all linked. It will blow your mind, the depth. That's what he says. Put this against the scripture. Maybe you're thinking of someone right now in your heart. You, yeah, they need to hear this message. Maybe it's somebody who has been contemplating suicide. Maybe it's somebody who's at their rope's end that they just can't go on any more. Be that person to step in the gap. Be that person to help them see the red flags. Be that person to show them what God's Word says about what a loving relationship should look like and should be. Because you never know. You just might help save someone. And maybe that's not what you. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, as Patty was talking about our young man, interesting, as I was sitting with Chantel at the chiropractor, uh, there was another young man there. And he had gone to the same place doing the same obstacle. Course, and he fell. He fell so hard he cracked his helmet. And he ended up with a massive concussion too. So those obstacle courses are pretty tricky. We want to continue to lift up the underlings. Got to see the new baby. That was the joy. The sadness of the loss of Jason. But cheerful, fond memories of the lives he touched. Are there others we'd like to lift up? Bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we know that there is so much heaviness maybe in this room and on our hearts and even for those that are watching and listening from afar. This world is sinful and it is broken. And we live in it and we can get caught up in it. And as Christians, we can feel like we're trapped and we can't say anything or we can't get out because it wouldn't be the Christian thing to do. Thank you for reminding us that Jesus was constantly standing up. He was constantly speaking out. But he was doing it in love. <coughs> we ask that you would be with each of the families that are hurting from loss or just tragedy. We ask that you would heal those that are broken, whether it be bones or hearts, minds, past, and relationships. We thank you for bringing this out as we know that healing is a journey. And it starts with first being convicted and recognizing it. And we thank you that your son came and he displayed everything that we need to know, the guidelines to have those healthy boundaries, to have the fun relationships, the loving relationships, the relationships that are both give and take, the relationships that grow us and nurture us and expand on the goodness of you. And we thank you that even on those times that we're going to find ourselves in a hurting spot, and maybe without words, 
that he even gave us a prayer that we can pray to you. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. As we come to Christ's banquet, we come remembering the relationship he had with his twelve closest. The model that he had set forth, he said, There is no greater love than he who lays down his life for another. He lifted up that loaf and he gave thanks and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, This is now my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up the cup, and he lifted it up, and he gave thanks, and he said, This is now going to represent a new covenant, a covenant between myself and you. It will be my blood that we shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. So as the body of Christ, we come before his feast, remembering the life that was laid down for each and every one of us, and going out and proclaiming that to all who will listen. Amen. If you would join with me in our next hymn, Learning to Lean. The handout we did because in the chorus book, it's only the refrain, and these are the verses.
We bow our head in prayer. There is no time like the present, Lord. You are meeting us here right now at this beautiful table in this beautiful sanctuary. It is here that we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here you offer all your gifts to the death and resurrection of your Son. We only have to ask that your most precious gift of love and forgiveness are given. Open your eyes today, Lord, to see the larger light to which you are calling us to share this special gift that we receive at this table. We praise you through your risen Son's name. Amen. You are the one God, and we thank you that you have called us to oneness with you and with others. When we drink this cup, we are reminded that in Christ's self-sacrificing love, all the barriers that would separate us have been broken down. Because of Christ on the cross, your love has proven stronger than human fear and hostility. When those times come in which we do feel separated from your love, empower us by your Spirit to ask for and receive your holy love. Then enable us to break down the barriers that separate others from you so that we may affirm around your table of love that we are indeed one in Christ's spirit around the world and forever. Amen. several blessings today. <clears throat> the blessing of prayer that can change and heal any heart. I'm going to leave you with the blessing of the love of God that can restore any soul. I want to leave you with the blessing of peace of Christ that can wash over anyone and make them new. And the blessing of the Holy Spirit that keeps us all together to help uplift and uphold one another. Now and forevermore.